Fabio, when we think about the roots of internet rap, it's difficult to do that without thinking about how the hip hop crew Odd Future really optimized that lane through their loud, free form, out of sync production and really personalities. Aside from their out of the box practices and imagery, it seemed that Odd Future was able to think ahead to a time when access to music, crafting an online audience, lifestyle branding, and the world of content creation would be just as, if not more than, making music and culture itself. In addition to their creative efforts, Odd Future poured their energy into all kinds of DIY entrepreneurial efforts, including clothing, pop-up shops for merch, stickers, and even television shows to feed their audience's appetite for their artistry. While Odd Future is not hip-hop's first you could say alternative rap group, nor are they the first to use shock value in entertainment to drive interest. They were among the first to take those qualities, package it, and translate them into sustainable and successful career trajectories. So if this crew was so instrumental in changing hip-hop landscape in everything from music to fashion to content to personalities, then what led to its untimely and unfortunate demise? Odd Future, a collective also known as Odd Future Wolfgang, began its journey as a crew in Los Angeles in around 2007. The group's original members, artists Tyler the Creator, Haji and Casey Veggies, DJ Left Brain, production team The Super 3, Matt Martians and Pyramid Vritra, and hype man Jasper Dolphin, also worked alongside other members who would join at a later date, including people like Earl Sweatshirt, Frank Ocean, Mike G., Brandon Deshay and Domo Genesis, DJ Taco Bennett, DJ and producer Sid the Kid, and hype man Nikel Smith, who would eventually become a skateboarder in his own right as well as a rapper. Odd Futures also included various cinematography, photography, acting, and fashion designers such as Rob Nasty, Legohead, Sagan Lockhart, L Boy, Lucas Vercetti, Julian Berman, and Poncho. While the collective is large, much of the attention that Odd Future garnered was due to the building, popularity, and growing success of Tyler the Creator, Frank Ocean, and Earl Sweatshirt's careers. One of the markers of the group's success was their capacity to use the internet in order to achieve exposure, visibility, interest, and most especially to generate a tremendous amount of loyalty from their fan base. Many agree that it was this kind of approach to building a fan base that ultimately allowed the group to break through a number of obstacles and achieve mainstream fame. Even before it became fashionable to let audiences into the behind the scenes happenings in your personal and professional life using social media apps such as Instagram, Snapchat, hell even kind of Twitter, Odd Future used platforms such as Tumblr and YouTube to grant fans access to their lives. Whether it was through photos or videos, fans could watch as the group collaborated together skateboarded, ate meals, or simply took some time out from work. By generating this kind of intimacy with their fans, Odd Future quickly moved from a group of friends to a group of cult stars who treated their fans as though they were a part of the Odd Future family, at least digitally. Beginning in 2008 and through to 2010, the crew would deliver a series of solo projects in addition to their collaborative and self-released debut mixtape titled The Odd Future Tape. At the top of 2008, Odd Future would begin by releasing a solo project from Casey Veggies titled Customized Greatly Volume 1, featuring Tyler the Creator. A short time later, in July of 2009, fellow member Haji would also go on to release his debut mixtape titled The Dina Tape. In addition to Haji's solo work, Tyler the Creator would also go on to release his debut mixtape, Bastard. By 2010, the collective would together release their second mixtape titled Radical. By 2010, the collective began to gain widespread attention. In November of 2010, Odd Future would complete a two-stop tour, first in London, then in New York City. The crew became well-known for concerts that shared common ground with punk rock performances. Case in point, alongside the music, audiences could find the collective stage diving and moshing to excite the crowd. In addition to the release of their 2012 debut studio album, The Odd Future Tape Volume 2, Fans also tuned in for Odd Future's Adult Swim comedy skit show called Loiter Squad and the development of their clothing line. As the collective continued to grow with the addition of Chicago-based rapper Brandon Deshay, Los Angeles rapper and songwriter Domo Genesis, Earl Sweatshirt, and L.A. singer-songwriter Frank Ocean, so too did Odd Future's fan base. Rapper and record producer Tyler the Creator is perhaps Odd Future's most well-known contributor. 
After co-founding alternative hip-hop collective Odd Future, he and groupmates Haji, Left Brain, and Casey Veggies would release their first mixtape in 2008. After releasing his debut solo mixtape Bastard the following year, which ranked 32nd on Pitchfork's Media's Top Albums of 2010, and then his debut studio album titled Goblin, Tyler the Creator would go on to sign a joint deal with Red Distribution and Sony Music Entertainment as a solo artist, as well as for his label Odd Future Records. By early 2011, Tyler the Creator shared his music video for Yonkers, which received significant attention from a number of online media outlets. As a result of this release, Tyler the Creator would go on to win Best New Artist for Yonkers at the 2011 MTV Video Music Awards, and yet despite the win, audiences reaction to Tyler the Creator's work was a mix. Known initially for his gritty horrorcore influenced material, especially in terms of the content on his first two solo projects, some popular culture critics took issue with his material and criticized him for the use of certain slurs in his lyrics, although back then people were a lot less sensitive to these things. Tyler the Creator, however, vehemently rejected the connection that some were making, and he refuted the attempt to categorize him as part of the horrorcore scene. Since then, Tyler the Creator has been associated with a variety of genres, including alternative hip-hop, bedroom pop, jazz, rap, R&B, and even neo-soul. This has been in part because of the transformations in his production. Over the years, Tyler the Creator has moved from gritty and dark sounds to a much more jazzy and soulful sonic approach, aided by the fact that he produces pretty much all of his records. He's disclosed that his sound has been deeply influenced by Eminem and Pharrell of the Neptunes, in fact, Tyler the Creator cites Pharrell's 2006 debut solo album In My Mind as the inspiration that led him to co-found the Odd Future Collective. By early 2011, Tyler the Creator had caught the eyes and ears of many in the industry. Among some of the figures that took a keen interest were Steve Rifkin, Jimmy Iovine, Rick Ross, and Jay-Z. The attention would lead Tyler the Creator to release his first studio album as well as his Odd Future collaborators to sign with Red Distribution Sony. As the attention increased in 2011, Tyler the Creator could be found on television making his debut on Late Night with Jimmy Fallon, as well as establishing his own TV show in collaboration with Odd Future called Loiter Squad on Cartoon Network. On September 8, 2011, that crew debuted their 15-minute live-action show composed of various sketches, man-on-the-street segments, pranks, and music made by Odd Future. In addition to television, in 2012, Tyler started Golf Wang, his clothing company and he began hosting Camp Flognaw Carnival, an annual music festival. Eventually, these ideas would expand into much larger initiatives, including Golf Media, his own streaming service app at a point, named which contained his own original scripted series, and a live stream of each Camp Flognaw Carnival. And we also have to address the fan-made part of this, which one of the most popular forums for music at the time was Odd Future Talk. Between 2013 and 2019, Tyler the Creator delivered a significant amount of musical material. He would usually drop a project every two years. And on the solo front, these albums included Wolf, Cherry Bomb, Flower Boy, Igor, and most recently Call Me If You Get Lost, all of which were released to widespread critical acclaim, as well as commercially getting better and better. In addition to his own work in 2017, Tyler the Creator worked with Frank Ocean to create the recording Biking and he then wrote and performed the theme song for scientist Bill Nye's new show, Bill Nye Saves the World. He would also go on to create a collaborative project titled Wang Sap with ASAP Rocky, though it was not until 2019 when he released his fifth studio album, Igor, that Tyler the Creator had his first number one album in the United States. Also, Wang Sap never really came out. An album that would lead to the artist winning in the best rap album category at the Grammys, which was his first Grammy and a goal that he had been looking forward to since the inception of his career. One of his most interesting marketing tactics to date was upon the release of his sixth studio album, Call Me If You Get Lost. In an attempt to generate attention to his new creative work, Tyler the Creator placed billboards in a number of major cities across the globe. The billboards contained a phone number that audiences could call and listen to a recorded conversation between the artist and his mother. Audiences soon learned that the recording was also included in the album as the recording Mama Talk. The album, which debuted at number one on the U.S. Billboard 200, would go on to receive widespread critical acclaim and ultimately become the rapper's second number one album in the United States. When Tyler the Creator invited Earl Sweatshirt to join Odd Future, he was originally known by the stage name Sly Tendencies. As his rap career progressed, he would go on to change in 2009 to Earl Sweatshirt. 
and he would then go on to develop his career as a rapper, songwriter, and record producer. Earl was initially discovered by fellow rapper Tyler the Creator who found him while visiting his MySpace account, where he admitted that he was a big fan of his work. Earl would initially gain acclaim and recognition at the age of 16 following the release of his 2010 debut mixtape Earl, which was produced by Tyler the Creator. The album would gain so much attention that Complex Magazine would name it its 24th best album of 2010. However, despite his newfound fame, shortly after he released his first piece of artwork, his mother decided to send him to a boarding school, Coral Reef Academy, a therapeutic retreat school for at-risk boys outside of the Samoan capital of Apia, for getting into trouble with friends. Despite the support of fans, reports increasingly began to stir that Earl had stopped making music with Odd Future, all of which was supported by posts that Tyler the Creator had made on Twitter and Forum Spring platforms. According to Tyler, the reason for Earl's decision to stop working with the collective was because his mother refused to grant permission to release any of Earl's music while he was at Coral Reef Academy. Earl was expected to earn back his privileges as well as the ability to return home. And even while he could not make music with Odd Future, reports indicate that he wrote rhymes that would eventually form as part of his only contribution to Odd Future's mixtape, The Odd Future Tape Volume 2. Earl would eventually return to Los Angeles after a two-year absence in 2012. Fans were alerted to his return after rumors spread and a video surfaced on YouTube that included a preview of a new song. In the video, fans were told that if they wanted the full thing, they would have to give him 50,000 followers on Twitter. Upon his return in February of 2012, Earl decided to rejoin the collective Odd Future where he began producing new music. This return would ultimately lead to the release of his debut studio album titled Doris in 2013. In their review of the album, Pitchfork was noted as writing, Doris gets as much of its jollies from settling into the dark, forbidding soundscapes as it does from unexpectedly ripping us up out of them. Without the noirish serial killer stories of earlier work to fall back on, Earl has discovered new ways to shock and disorient the listener. His second album, I Don't Like Shit, I Don't Go Outside, would follow two years later, and then Earl would release his third album, titled Some Rap Songs, three years after that. In addition to working alongside Tyler the Creator, Earl's sweatshirt was featured in work alongside different artists like Frank Ocean, Domo Genesis of Odd Future, The Alchemist, Vince Staples, who he's been collaborating with since his first mixtape, Action Bronson, and many others. By September 2013, Complex had named Earl the 10th best producer in hip-hop, and critics showered him with praise. Case in point, his Project Doris debuted at number 5 on the Billboard 200, and it earned a perfect score in both The Guardian and The Los Angeles Times for its rhyme schemes, lyrics, and the gritty underground production. Frank Ocean After Tyler the Creator, one of the members who's perhaps just as visible, if not more, and well-liked is Christopher Bro, also known professionally as Frank Ocean. The singer, songwriter, and rapper was loved by many of his fans for his idiosyncratic music style, introspective songwriting, and his incredibly wide vocal range. Beginning his music career as a ghostwriter, Frank Ocean would eventually go on to join Odd Future in 2010 and then release his critically acclaimed debut mixtape, Nostalgia, in 2011. This success would eventually lead to the performer securing a recording contract with Def Jam Records. This trajectory would inevitably lead to the success of the widely popular debut album Channel Orange in 2012, which won Best Urban Contemporary Album at the 2013 Grammy Awards. Despite his relatively quick rise to acclaim and visibility, Frank Ocean would then decide to take a four-year hiatus from the public eye, and it would not be until 2016 when Frank Ocean would return with the release of his visual project Endless. Many argue that Frank Ocean's return in 2016 was only intended to fulfill contractual obligations with his label Def Jam. Shortly thereafter, that is only a day later, the artist would go on to self-release his highly anticipated second album, Blonde. The album debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 and was certified platinum since. Beginning in 2006, Frank Ocean began establishing himself as a songwriter under the name Lonnie Bro. After getting a songwriting deal, he would start generating artistic materials for Justin Bieber, Beyonce, John Legend, and Brandy. Frank Ocean was writing so much for people that he was on record stating, There was a point when I was composing for other people, and then it might have been comfy to continue to do that and enjoy that income stream and the anonymity. But that's not why I moved away from school and away from family. By the time he had joined the collective Odd Future in 2009, Frank Ocean would go on to adopt the artistic name of Frank Ocean. Once he was part of the collective and working alongside Tyler the Creator, Frank Ocean's songwriting was reinvigorated. 
This would ultimately lead to him meeting Tricky Stewart in 2009, who would then help him sign a writing contract with Def Jam Records. While working with the label, Frank Ocean would put out a series of materials that would lead to a number of outlets writing highly favorable reviews of his work. For instance, NPR noted that Ocean's songwriting is smart and subtle, setting him apart from the pack, while Rolling Stone would say that he was a gifted Avon R&B smoothie. Whatever the hell that means. As he came to greater fame and visibility, Frank Ocean worked collaboratively with many of the most notable popular culture members and began expanding his sound. In addition to Tyler, the creator and members of Odd Future, prior to the release of his debut studio album in 2012, he also worked with Kanye West and Jay-Z on their joint Watch the Throne and Bridget Kelly. By 2012, Frank Ocean's first studio album, Channel Orange, demonstrated that the artist was working with a dense musical fusion of various sounds that included jazz, soul, and R&B funk, and even electronic music. The only featured female artist in Odd Future, Sydney Lauren Bennett, known professionally as Sid, formerly Sid the Kid, first joined Odd Future and then later founded her own band, The Internet, in 2011. First making music while she was still living with her parents, Sid would work in a supportive capacity in much of her career until 2017 when she released her first debut solo single, All About Me, and debut solo album, Fiend. In addition to working with Odd Future, Sid would also work with other international artists, including Korean R&B artist Dean and his music video for Love, Lil Uzi Vert's second studio album Eternal A Take on his song Urgency, and When Love's Around, and even on pop artist Zayn Malik's third album, Nobody's Listening. In a 2017 XXL article, when asked about the rise and fall of Odd Future and her eventual departure from the group in 2016, Sid stated that she always believed what they were doing was special and important and historic, though it was touring that tore the collective apart. She went on to state, Stuff got out of hand when we started touring. Most of us never had money and had never been on tour, and it was a lot to take in. We were kids. Still are. In an earlier interview in 2016 with the New York Times, Sid admitted that she felt lonely in the group. She stated, I couldn't talk to any of them about it. We weren't all that close, and they never seemed to want to hear it. And finally, when she did decide to leave, she claimed that the collective was not about her departure because they felt they lost their get-out-of-jail-free card. They weren't happy about it. It's easy to say they aren't homophobic because Sid is there. In addition to the more well-known artists in the group, Odd Future featured Dominique Marquise Cole, also known as Domo Genesis. After joining the collective in mid-2009, Domo Genesis would release a series of mixtapes, including Under the Influence in 2011, provide features on the albums of the other artists, and make television appearances on Odd Future's Loiter Squad as Young Gunshot. By 2016, Domo would go on to release the lead single Dapper, featuring Anderson Pack, to his debut solo album, Genesis, and would then embark on a tour in support of its release. Since the group disbanded, Domo Genesis has independently released a mixtape titled Aren't You Glad You're You on SoundCloud, which was executive produced by rapper Evidence, and in 2021, Domo Genesis was featured on Tyler the Creator's sixth album, Call Me If You Get Lost. The collaboration marked the first time the Odd Future members had worked with one another on a song since the collective had disbanded. Casey Veggies. Like many of the earliest members of Odd Future, Casey Jones, better known by his stage name Casey Veggies, began his career by releasing five independent mixtapes in 2007 under LA clothing and management company Peas and Carrots. As a founding member of Odd Future, he also appeared on the collective's first joint project, The Odd Future Tape. After contributing to this project, Casey would branch out on his own. In an interview with Respect Magazine, Casey responded to questions about departing from Odd Future. It's hard to explain, really, but I just had more of a different vision for my own rap career. I wanted to do my own thing. Once Casey was off on his own, he could be found working alongside, whether on record or tour, with artists like YG, Mac Miller... Wiz Khalifa, and many more. In addition to other artists, Casey would also occasionally work with fellow Odd Future members Tyler the Creator, Haji Beats, and Domo Genesis. By 2013, Casey would sign a record deal with VIC and Epic Records. Then there's the death of Odd Future. By mid-2015, many news outlets were questioning whether Odd Future was still a unit. Many reporters noted that Tyler the Creator and Earl Sweatshirt had not recorded any music as a duo since 2013 and it had been nearly a year since Frank Ocean had parted ways from Odd Future managers Christian and Kelly Clancy, which some merely attributed to his reclusive nature. 
Unlike other hip-hop breakups, Odd Future's story was not smeared with major beef and animosity between members, shady money dealings, or members being pitted against one another over media scandals. Instead, it appeared that the members were straying further and further away from one another, a distance that some attributed simply to young adults being busily involved with their own lives and interests and ultimately growing apart as a result of a difference in personality. This sentiment was perhaps most evident in a Fader cover story where Tyler, commenting on Frank Ocean's departure from the group, said, he could care less about the spotlight type stuff, which is cool. I wish I had taken his route and just disappeared from social media for the past year. I got too much stuff going on, but that would be so tight. In some instances, reporters argue that one of the reasons the group didn't last was because this collective of quote-unquote misfits, as they called them, did not fit well into the conventional concept of a rap group. In many ways, the group was understood more so as kind of punk rock within hip-hop. They'll be united with the audience based on a shared sense of angst, exclusion from what was mainstream initially, and a desire to rage against the status quo conventions. Others suggested that when Odd Future's crew member Earl Sweatshirt was taken away and sent to complete his reformative sentence at Coral Reef Academy, it shook the group. Reports suggested that they had felt as though they had lost a family member. Although he returned two years later, the group may have been reunited in physical form, but they were increasingly drifting apart, especially the more well-known the Odd Future Collective got, and fans gravitated more strongly to some members over others. For many fans, Tyler was the star and representative of Odd Future. Reports suggest that the first sign of animosity brewing between group members was when Haji called Tyler the creator out at the fourth annual Camp Flognaw Carnival, labeling Tyler a fraud who turned his back on members of the crew for no apparent reason. However, reports indicated that the tensions which appeared publicly on the annual Camp Flognaw stage had also been stirring for months and had led to a breakdown in the functionality of the collective. Tyler, the creator's star, was getting bigger, and in some cases, he had become an obstacle for other members to overcome, and as a result, many in Odd Future found it difficult to live in his shadow. For Earl, a member who was absent for a significant portion of the collective's rise to fame, it may have been difficult for him to adapt to Tyler's celebrity star, in part because he has less time to get used to the idea upon his return. Other reports indicated that once Earl returned, to LA from his reformative sentence, he had changed his mind about the use of music that portrayed murder and many other dark concepts. Many attribute this transformation to his recent work with survivors while in Samoa. Stumbling over his words while conducting an interview, Earl Sweatshirt stated, there's nothing you can, there's no, you can't evade, there's no defense if you have any ounce of humanity. As a result of his recent experiences, both Tyler and Earl increasingly had differing opinions on the use of violent subject matter. While Odd Future fans expected Earl to jump back into his work with the collective immediately, the artist instead decided to sign his own record deal and establish his own imprint. Upon learning the news of Earl's return, Tyler's messages on Twitter indicated that he had mixed emotions about Earl's uneasy transition back into the collective. In his tweets, Tyler stated, I've never been excited and angry at the same time until today. That's a messed feeling. Everyone wants me to tweet something right now. F everything else. I just want to go skate and talk about the past year. F the music and the public. This stuff sucks. Y'all have no idea. Tyler publicly accepted that he and Earl grew apart and had changed in their individual lives. Then, by May of 2015, the group officially announced that they had terminated their relationship. News of the breakup came as a result of a set of tweets on Tyler, the creator's account. In the tweets, Tyler suggested that Odd Future was over. Fans began to connect the dots. Many argue that despite news of the collective's breakup, the positive news was that it might lead to albums from other members, including Mike G and the Internet. With the massive success of Tyler the Creator, Earl Sweatshirt, and Frank Ocean, Odd Future continued to have a bright future as individuals, whereas Earl Sweatshirt kind of faded back towards more of an underground sound in terms of commercial success. Frank Ocean really hasn't done music in many years, and Tyler the Creator continued to go on to potentially really be a superstar that everyone always expected him to be. But let me know what y'all think in the comments. Like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell if you enjoyed. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you for watching. Peace.